All right, hello everyone, and welcome to A New Host Touches the Beacon. Let's do a quick question. Has anybody here played a little game called Skyrim? Cool. Has anybody played Skyrim with mods? All right, even better. You're going to love this. I'm excited to talk to you today about how we combined our passion for video games and hacking and applied the hacker mindset to explore the landscape of one of our favorite games in a brand new way. Just a quick note, I will share a link at the end that contains the original blog post and these slides. My name is Devin Clary. I'm also known as a Romac. I am a penetration tester, and I've been taking a crack at this cybersecurity thing for about six years now. And down below is my better half, partner in crime, Marlo Clary, also known as Isney. Um, she cannot be here today due to a last minute family emergency, so all that means for this talk is that you're just stuck with me for the whole thing. Um, she did earn her place to remain on the slide as she is important to the story. Really, I just couldn't figure out how to remove her without breaking the whole slide, but we won't tell her that. We're both big fans of Skyrim, and this all started as she was gearing up to start a new playthrough. To summarize Skyrim real quick, Skyrim is a very large single player, open world, role playing game that's full of quests, landscapes, magic, and dragons. So what makes Skyrim a great candidate for this project? Well, almost 13 years after release, people just keep playing this game. Why? Well, partly because they keep focusing on making content for the Fallout series and not giving us Elder Scrolls VI anytime soon, but also one of the greatest attractions of Skyrim is the modding community. So let's talk about mods for a second. Mods are developed by fellow players and third-party developers to modify and alter some aspects of the video game. And for Skyrim, there's just so many mods out there. Enhancements to character creations, cosmetics, new quest lines, graphics and textures, like you see in the screenshot here on the side, comparing a non-modded scene versus a modded scene. So there she was, Isney, looking to start her like 11th playthrough of Skyrim. And as she was browsing through the mods, she notices like virus scan safe to use label on the website. And that made her curious. Like what does, a, what does an unsafe Skyrim mod look like? So we started talking about it. And the timing was perfect because then I was just starting to get into studying malware development. And I thought of this idea that would be a great challenge. Isney said, and I quote, I cannot even play this game until we figure out this mystery. So we began planning out on how we were going to make this happen. Some may even ask, is anyone even playing Skyrim anymore? At the time of this recent screenshot, there were more than 24,000 people playing the game. The game has around 22 million owners and had an all time peak of 287,000 plus players on release. Now keep in mind, these stats only reflect the Steam platform on PC. So not console, GOG, Alexa, fridge, lawnmower, or wherever the hell you can play Skyrim anymore these days. Now keeping those numbers in mind, let's take a look at the bottom part of the slide. Exploring within a popular mod website, we see that both versions of Skyrim have more than 60,000 mods available to download and more than six and a half billion downloads combined. How does one even make a mod for Skyrim? There's two popular ways to get started making a mod. The first one is using what's called the creation kit. And this was released by Bethesda Game Studios with some restrictions and very limited coding languages. Then we have SKSE, which stands for the Skyrim script extender. This is a community made mod platform that allows Skyrim mods to be developed in C++. So now that we have covered some of the basics, the question was, can we make Skyrim something can we make Skyrim summon external programs in Windows by conjuring something to trigger it? Or in other words, can we make Windows execute something based off of an in-game event? The answer is yes. And I'll show you how in just a minute. So I'll have to borrow a line from Todd Howard here and ensure you it just works. But first, we just needed to figure out what conditions should be met in the game for our code to execute. And since our end goal is to execute a C2 beacon, we decided go with going and picking up Meridia's beacon in the game. Meridia's beacon is a quest item that spawns into the world once the player hits level 12. 
Once this item is found and picked up by the player, that loud voice comes through, probably through your headset, and says, a new hand touches the beacon. Known to Skyrim players to be trolled by this experience. So what do we need besides Skyrim? We've tested this on the GOG and the Steam version of the game, so either one of those should work fine. We also need SKSE that we just talked about, the Skyrim Script Extender, Visual Studio to compile our code, VCPKG, which is just a C++ package manager, a scripting template available on GitHub just to get us started, our proof of concepts that we've put up on our GitHub, and finally, a C2 framework. And for this project, we chose to go with Havoc. Here, we see an example of local code execution. This entire code just says, do something when, when a hit event is registered. And the only purpose of lines 8 through 11 are to open the Windows Calculator app. So putting this logic together, we say, when we hit someone in the game, open the Windows Calculator app. I think we're ready to check out a quick video of what this actually looks like. So here we go. We're running into the village like a maniac, smacking an NPC in the face. Boom. Calculator. This is an exciting milestone when developing any kind of malicious code because if we can get something like Calculator to run, we can get just about anything that we want to run, as we will see soon enough. Since everything in this project revolves around picking up Meridia's beacon, we needed to find a way to obtain the beacon item other than hitting level 12 and running all over the world looking for it. To figure out how this game interacts with its objects, we went down this rabbit hole of form IDs and base IDs. So I'll try to summarize this concept the best I can. Form IDs are unique identifiers for everything in the game. So everything has one. Everything from quests, NPCs, dragons, followers, lockpicks, you name it, it's got one. Now this matters because we're going to cheat the system a little bit. We're going to be using an in-game console system and just spawn the beacon item in front of the character instead of spending all those hours looking for it in the world, right? As you can see in this slide, we found Meridia's beacon form ID pretty easily on the web, Elder Scrolls wiki page, and that is the 4E4E6 you see here. Next, we're just going to use some logging techniques to find out how the game generates a copy of Meridia's beacon and how the game tracks that item. Here's the meat of the logging script we use to log how the game is able to identify Meridia's beacon item in the world. We compile this in Visual Studio to a DLL, and then we load that DLL into our Skyrim game. Okay, let's take a look at a video that will help us get the final value that we need. Here, we're going to use that in-game console to spawn the beacon with a specific command, player.placeatme 4e4e6, which is that form ID that we just found. And that beacon will be placed in front of the character. The character picks up the beacon, and then we're just going to completely exit out of the game for now. The objective here is to locate and review the logs located within the game's directory. This will show us how the game recognizes the copy of Meridia's beacon that we just spawned. Here we find that new value, or the base ID, for the Meridia beacon item listed here at 320742. Moving forward, we will utilize this new value to finish our quest. So we go back into the source code of our mod experiment, and we start figuring out how do we use that base ID that we just got to expand on our malicious mod. We see here in line 22, towards the bottom of the image, we start implementing this if statement or if condition that says, if an in-game object that matches this specific ID, 320742, is activated or picked up by the player, execute this following code. Let's take a look at lines 10 and 11 towards the top of the screenshot. We see here this is just where the attacker would put in their IP address and their listening port number. The rest of the script is simply just reverse shell code obtained from the ever resourceful World Wide Web. Let's, let's see this in action. First, we quickly see a netcat listener on port 8000. We go back into the game. We use that console system again to spawn the item. Hopefully, on a flat enough surface, the roundish beacon item doesn't just roll away on us. The character is going to pick it up. We'll switch back. Bam, we have a reverse shell. 
Cool. Mission accomplished, right? We'll check the IP address listed here with the one shown against on the desktop to make sure they match. So reverse shells are nice, right? They do the job. But we couldn't help but ask ourselves, what can we do to take this concept a step further? As mentioned before, the in-game item is called Meridius Beacon, so in the oh-so-jolly spirit of the lols, we're going to upgrade this reverse shell to a command and control beacon. Uh, we're using Havoc C2 straight off of GitHub, and notice here that we're using the Windows shellcode format for the agent, which is going to generate a binary file. Uh, if you ever tried viewing a binary file as a plain text, you'll recognize this format of encrypted beauty seen at the top of the slide. But how do we get this binary code into our malicious C++ Skyrim mod code? In comes a program called XXD to save our day. XXD is a command line tool that primarily used for creating and analyzing hexadecimal dumps from files. All we had to do was utilize this command line to tool to convert the binary file contents to a hexadecimal represented on the left side of the screen. Then we place that shell code within the C++ mod shell code placeholder seen in the red box on the right side of your screen. From here, in Visual Studio, we simply build the code, load the mod in the Skyrim, and check the results. This time, we set up three separate virtual machine instances, each running Skyrim, all with our new Beacon mod installed. We set up Havoc on one Ubuntu virtual machine, and then one by one, we cycle through each virtual machine, each instance of Skyrim, bring up that console command system, spawn the beacon item that triggers our code on pickup. We can see in the video here that each beacon executes separately and successfully calls back to our Havoc C2 server. This is a very small scale demo for a proof of concept, but imagine this kind of functionality already hidden within the popular mod. You'd be seeing a lot more beacons here. And now that we have all three beacons, we go through the IP addresses one by one and verify with each Windows host IP address that we see on the desktop. This is definitely cooler than a standard reverse shell. But again, how can we take this concept a step further? So we just demonstrated figure one with separate instances of Skyrim running within separate virtual machines. But what if we were able to turn Skyrim into a multiplayer game where all players are synced to the same server in the same world instance? Of course, this is Skyrim, so there's a mod for that too, called Skyrim Together. Let's see what happens when we chain that mod with our mod to further the chaos. Here we see a blank Havoc user interface, no beacons running. And now we're going to simulate three players in the game on the same server at the same location. Bear with me here as I cycle through each player to show full control. One of these players is going to simulate as our cyber criminal. And the first thing this player is going to do is open up that console system and spawn three of those malicious beacon items straight into his inventory. Next, this player is going to go and drop off two of those malicious beacons into a random barrel and keep one for himself. We'll now swap over to the second player, and we're going to have this player go to that same barrel and pick up one of those malicious beacon items. This player is going to open their inventory and show everybody that they do indeed have the beacon item in their possession. The last player will repeat the same steps. It's going to go to that same barrel, pick up one of those malicious beacon items, and expose their inventory to show us all that they have it. Perfect. Now let's switch back to Havoc server and see what happened. We successfully find all three malicious beacon callbacks. Excellent. So we, we built this code off of a pre-existing in-game item. but. Just imagine the kind of possibilities with proper mod support, like, for example, new spells could be created, and when it strikes another player, this kind of malicious code could execute, almost like a twisted game of tag for hackers. And maybe this is all too much, and maybe like a stealthier approach is desired to be taken. Let's take a look at a, a different path, where instead of a reverse shell or a beacon, 
maybe we just run some basic system enumeration commands on the target. Also, to change things up and to show the flexibility of this concept, we change the if condition to execute only when the player dies, so getting rid of the Meridia Beacon thing altogether. So only when the player runs out of health represented in code by the first box, our new code executes and performs a handful of enumeration commands on the target and then stores those results into a local file. And all of that's represented by the bigger box. Once all those results are collected, that file is then sent to a remote HTTP server set up by an attacker. So let's get a visual of this concept and see what kind of information those commands are able to give us. At the bottom right of the screen, we see this troublemaker get what's coming to him by the fine citizens of Riverwood. As the player goes down, take a look at the top left of the screen, we see a new file gets populated on the HTTP server. Nice. The game continues to run, completely clueless of what just happened. Let's review what kind of juicy details the attacker was able to obtain from the victim. For the best demo of this, Instead of using like a test environment, I actually ran this on the computer that's used day to day and just redacted anything sensitive. Details obtained included local username, local admin accounts, personal username and email accounts for various services such as like Microsoft, Adobe, GitHub. There is even some of my remote desktop IP addresses and usernames saved here. Next, we find the good old system info results informing us of the target's operating system and security patches installed. Not shown here, but we could have just as easily obtained like third-party software that's installed on this host, helping a malicious actor discover various attack paths. Here we see SMB shares uh, available to this specific host. These kinds of details can give an intruder a decent idea at mapping out the target's environment. And finally, my favorite part. Here we see an example of stored Wi-Fi SSIDs and their plain text passwords from the target host. I've even set up an example just for this talk, seen here named B-Sides Demo, and a password shown at the bottom, B-Sides Demo Password. Well folks, our quest has been completed and we have reached the conclusion of this talk. Hopefully what you take away from today's talk is just a reminder that code is just that, it's just code. And when you're so busy staying vigilant all day, doing everything in your power to stay safe from cyber criminals, it's just so easy to sink into your favorite pastime and forget that malicious code comes in many different forms, including video game mods that can look quite attractive for your next playthrough. I hope you walk away with the knowledge that not even the gray beards of High Hothgar could provide you Dragonborners, and by the ninth, have a fantastic B-Sides. I do want to give a quick thank you to B-Sides for letting me stand up here and talk about our project and a big thank you for all of you who came to see it. No lollygagging, there's only a few minutes for questions and please feel free to visit us on our website, hexbitheads.com to find this blog, these slides and check out more of our adventures. Thank you. I don't know if it, do we do the microphone thing in here? Do we have one of those? I can shout. Sure. Uh, scares of like the viability. Did you try to like upload to like Nexus mods or anything like that? A part of me wanted to. Sorry. A part of me wanted to, but no, I didn't go that far. <laughs> yes. Did you have knowledge of the scene exploded in your lab? The hit boss that are actually being used by the I I don't. Um and the the hard thing is, and I've thought about this, is like looking, even analyze this one. If you wanted to try and test mods out there, how would you even do that? Because you can run the mod, you can execute the game, and you can play for hours, and it may not actually trigger anything like this example. It doesn't even trigger until you hit level 12 and you pick up the Meridius Beacon. So you could be hours into the game before you even notice, right? So, good question. Yo. So, so are the mods not source available on like the modding sites? They're like running binary and it's not optimized? Typically they're compiled in DLLs. So no. No.
an environment like that and basically you're bringing the console over. Mm -hmm. At least to, to the last of my knowledge, since this does require that uh, SKSE framework, I do not believe that's available on console platforms. I believe that is PC only. Cool. Thank you. Anything else? Yep. Yeah. Engine. Um, I believe the other one was Fallout 4, that they have an SKSE version of Fallout 4. I have not tested it myself for this proof of concept, but I, I, I'm sure with some tweaking it would probably be, be very similar. Yes. Yep. For that multiplayer demo, did they all have to have the mod installed or just the server? The, they all had the, have the mod installed, wow. yes. Yep. Just curious, because there's so many mods, is there any kind of scanning or help or any kind of like proactive? So Nexus does some form of scanning, which was almost making me curious if I upload mine, what happened, but I didn't. Um, but when when we did this, this is this is not known or signatured, right? So even Windows Defender didn't care. I mean, so I think it would be pretty difficult to to track something down. It's, when you talk about over sixty thousand mods and trying to, you know, if you're on the Reddit or something, you see playthroughs that are four hundred plus mods easily. You know, it's it's a lot. Oh, oh, I don't know. Yeah. You could, um, I'm sure you could inject the server. I, I did play with it a little bit. I didn't get far enough to, to make that kind of proof of concept, but I'm, I'm sure um, I'm sure you could figure out a way to, even if you had to redirect and have it download elsewhere, but you, yeah, I'm sure. Yep. Yeah. So what's the limitation? You, you work with mostly uh, command prompt tools. Could you use PowerShell? Could you run around? Could you, what's the limitation? Um, as long as it compiles in, in C++, yeah, and executes there, there. Um, I did use CMD because specifically the, um, the NetSH command that took the Wi-Fi stuff, that was like, that was the only thing I got to work and that took a little tinkering. But sure, I'm sure you could, yeah, have a PowerShell alternative as you wish. Yeah. Uh, this might be just a guess question. Do you know how many Skyrim installs are on corporate machines versus personal? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends on where you work and what you're doing on late night shifts and when you're supposed to be working, but uh, no, don't have any numbers like that. And if you haven't already, I do have a couple sticker things left, but yes, go ahead. Do you have any ideas as to potential like defenses against techniques like this? Like is it something that like SKSC could be, could be patched to not allow our curious people to be run something like that? Or is this something that is really only determined by the there probably could be some defenses built on SKSC, but we do also have to give those guys enough credit because they put in a lot of work to get to as far as they did. So anything beyond that, I mean, it's just, um, it's hard to try to convince somebody to sandbox Skyrim for an entire playthrough to make sure you don't have any listeners pop up, right? That's insane. Yeah. Skyrim, e yes, Skyrim SE.exe because it was used in the special edition. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Cool. Good? Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Again, I got a couple more sticker packages up here if you didn't get one.